Back when I was 18, I spent most of my time at my friend Alex's place to avoid the constant arguments at home. Alex's house was my refuge, a place where I could feel normal, even if his parents weren't thrilled about me being around all the time. They were polite, but I could always tell when they wanted me gone. One summer night, I decided to leave a little earlier than usual, around 11 p.m., so I wouldn't overstay my welcome. It was one of those humid nights where the air feels thick and every noise seems to echo a little too loudly. I waved goodbye to Alex and started the walk back to my place, cutting through the quiet residential streets. The neighborhood was usually peaceful at this hour, with the occasional porch light flickering and the hum of air conditioners in the distance. As I turned onto a side street, I noticed something off. At first, I couldn't put my finger on it, but then I realized it was too quiet. Even the cicadas had gone silent. That's when I heard it, a dragging sound like something heavy being pulled across gravel. I slowed my pace, straining my ears. The noise was coming from a few houses down near the old Johnson place, where a row of overgrown hedges lined the sidewalk. Curiosity got the better of me, and I crossed the street, trying to see through the gaps in the hedges. I caught a glimpse of someone, a hunched figure struggling with a large, dark bag. He moved slowly, the bag scraping against the ground as he pulled it across the driveway. At first, I thought it might be Mr. Johnson, the elderly man who lived alone since his wife passed, but this figure seemed wrong, too tall, too lanky, and the way he moved was almost mechanical, like he was dragging something much heavier than he could handle. I took a step back, intending to mind my own business and keep walking, but then the figure stopped. He stood completely still, his head tilted slightly as if he sensed me watching. My pulse quickened and I ducked down behind the hedge, my heart hammering in my chest. I cursed under my breath for being so nosy, but I couldn't help it. Something about the scene was just too unsettling. I peeked through the hedge again, expecting the figure to be gone, but he was still there, now turned directly toward me. The dim porch light barely illuminated his face but I could make out hollowed eyes and a tight, unnerving grin that made my skin crawl. He raised a finger to his lips as if to shush me, then bent back down, continuing to drag the bag toward the backyard. I felt a cold sweat break out across my forehead. My gut told me to leave, to get as far away from there as possible. But just as I began to step back, I heard a low, strangled moan, like someone desperately trying to call out but being muffled. The sound sent a jolt of fear through me, and I realized it was coming from the direction of the bag. I spun around and walked quickly down the sidewalk, trying to keep my breathing steady, but my mind raced with what I'd just seen. I glanced over my shoulder, half expecting the figure to be following me. Instead, I saw the old man standing at the edge of his driveway, watching me with that same unsettling grin, the bag now nowhere in sight. I made it home in record time, slammed the door behind me, and locked every bolt. I told myself it was nothing, that I'd imagined the whole thing, but I couldn't shake the image of that smile or the thought of what might have been inside that bag. I barely slept that night, jumping at every creak of the old house. The next morning, I decided to walk past the old Johnson place again, hoping for some explanation that would make me feel less like I'd witnessed something I wasn't supposed to. When I got there, my stomach dropped. The driveway was empty, but a dark reddish stain had soaked into the gravel, leading toward the back gate, which was slightly ajar. I considered calling the police, but what would I even tell them? That I saw an old man dragging a bag and smiling in the dark? Before I could decide what to do, a voice startled me. It was one of the neighbors, a woman I recognized from passing by occasionally. She noticed my uneasy look and said, You saw him too, huh? I tried to play dumb, but she shook her head. I've heard those noises at night too. The dragging, the strange groans. Old man Johnson, he's not been the same since his wife died last year. You hear strange things coming from that house sometimes. Best to stay away. I nodded and walked away quickly, the back of my neck prickling with unease. As I turned the corner, I couldn't resist glancing back. There in the upstairs window, I saw him again just a silhouette against the curtain, standing motionless, 
as if he knew I was watching. I tried to convince myself that it was just a strange old man with a creepy smile, nothing more. But I couldn't ignore the feeling in my gut, the way my skin crawled every time I walked past that house. After that, I took a different route home from Alex's place, avoiding the old Johnson place entirely. I didn't want to know what was in that bag or why he smiled like that. A few months later, I heard that Mr. Johnson had been moved to a care facility and his house went up for sale. No one mentioned anything strange and I kept my mouth shut. I'd rather live with the questions than find out what really happened on that driveway. But even now, whenever I hear the sound of something heavy being dragged, I can't help but freeze, waiting for that same whisper I heard that night. And every time I remind myself, some things are better left unseen. It was the summer of 2018, and my cousin Jason invited me to spend a few days with him at his family's remote cabin up in the Adirondacks. The cabin was part of a small, quiet community nestled deep in the woods, surrounded by tall trees and far from the nearest town. There were only about eight other cabins nearby, all spaced far enough apart that you couldn't easily see your neighbors. The area had no cell service, and the only internet connection was through a spotty satellite link. It was supposed to be a relaxing getaway, just fishing, hiking, and late nights playing cards by the fireplace. The first few days went as planned. We explored the woods, swam in the nearby lake, and roasted marshmallows over a campfire. During our walks, we occasionally ran into a guy named Mike, who was staying at a nearby cabin. He was in his late 20s, always friendly, but a bit odd. He mentioned he liked camping alone and that he'd been coming to this area every summer for years. One evening, Jason suggested we take a walk down to a small abandoned ranger station about a mile from our cabin. I wasn't thrilled with the idea, especially as it was getting dark, but Jason convinced me, saying it would be cool to check it out. We grabbed a couple of flashlights and headed into the woods following the narrow trail toward the ranger station. As we walked, the air grew colder and the trees seemed to close in around us. We joked around to keep the mood light, but there was an underlying sense of unease. After about 20 minutes, we reached the station, a small weathered building with boarded up windows. It looked like it hadn't been touched in years. Jason shone his flashlight around and we noticed strange marks on the door, like deep scratches running from top to bottom. It looked like an animal had clawed at it, but the scratches were much too wide to be from anything like a bear. We both felt a chill, but Jason insisted on taking a look inside. He found a loose board on one of the windows, and we managed to pry it open enough to squeeze through. Inside, the station was empty, just a dusty desk, a few broken chairs, and scattered papers. We poked around for a few minutes, but there wasn't much to see. As we turned to leave, I thought I heard a faint rustling sound outside. I asked Jason if he heard it too, but he shrugged it off, saying, it was probably just an animal. We climbed back out through the window, but when we got outside, we noticed that the door, which had been tightly shut when we arrived, was now slightly ajar. Jason's smile faded, and we both stood frozen for a moment, listening to the sounds of the woods. There was a faint but unmistakable crunch of footsteps nearby, too heavy to be an animal. Suddenly, Jason's flashlight flickered, and for a split second, we caught a glimpse of a figure standing just beyond the tree line, watching us. He was tall and wore a hooded jacket that made it impossible to see his face. The flashlight flickered back on, and just as quickly, he was gone. We turned around, grabbed each other's arms, and ran back down the trail as fast as we could. We reached the cabin out of breath, slamming the door behind us. Jason locked it and double-checked the windows while I tried to catch my breath. We didn't see or hear anything else that night, but we barely slept, jumping at every creak and rustle outside. The next morning, Jason went outside to check around the cabin. He found fresh footprints in the mud leading up to the front porch and then back toward the woods. Whoever had been watching us had come right up to the cabin while we were inside. We decided to pack up and leave early, figuring it wasn't worth sticking around. As we loaded our car, we spotted Mike walking along the dirt road, heading back toward his cabin. He waved and asked if everything was all right, we told him we were leaving, making up an excuse about a family emergency. He gave us a knowing smile saying, that's probably for the best. Sometimes the woods get to you, you know? We didn't think much of it at the time, 
But when we got back home and did some research, we found out that the area had a history of strange disappearances and reports of people being stalked while camping. There were even old newspaper articles about a few hikers who had gone missing near the ranger station years ago. I still don't know if Mike was involved or if he was just another camper who happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But I'll never forget that figure in the woods, the sound of footsteps trailing us, and the feeling of being watched. It was a reminder that even in the 21st century, there are still places where you can vanish without a trace. And the line between safety and danger is a lot thinner than you'd like to believe. Three years ago, after a bad breakup, I moved into a small rundown apartment on the edge of town. It was the kind of place with thin walls, creaky floors, and windows that rattled in the wind, but it was all I could afford, and I was just trying to start fresh. My mental state wasn't great. I felt isolated, and I struggled to sleep most nights. But things took a darker turn after a few weeks of living there. It started with a sense of being watched. At first, I brushed it off as my mind playing tricks on me. After all, it was a new place, and I wasn't used to the sounds. But one night, as I was lying in bed trying to drift off, I thought I heard footsteps in the hallway outside my door. Slow, deliberate footsteps, like someone was pacing back and forth. I sat up, listening intently, but the sounds faded away. I told myself it must have been one of my neighbors. The next morning, I found a smudged handprint on the outside of my bedroom window. It was too high up for someone to have accidentally touched it from the ground. I stared at it for a long time, trying to convince myself it had been there before, and I just hadn't noticed. But deep down, I knew that wasn't true. I wiped it away and told myself to be more careful about locking the windows. A few nights later, I had the most vivid dream. In the dream, I woke up to find my apartment door wide open, the hallway beyond swallowed in darkness. My phone wouldn't work, and I couldn't call anyone for help. I felt an overwhelming urge to run, so I grabbed my keys and bolted out into the hallway. But instead of the familiar corridor, I found myself in a deserted parking garage, my footsteps echoing against the concrete walls. As I tried to find my way out, I saw a shadow dart between the parked cars. The air was cold, and I could hear the faint scuffing of shoes on the floor behind me. When I turned around, a figure stepped out from behind a pillar, dressed in a dark hoodie that obscured his face. He moved closer, and I noticed his hands. Long, thin fingers that twitched unnaturally. My legs felt like laid, but I forced myself to run. I made it to my car, but the engine wouldn't start. The figure was getting closer, his footsteps deliberate and slow. He stopped right outside my driver's side window, and through the glass, I could just make out the bottom half of his face, twisted into a smirk. He reached out, pressing a palm against the window, and I woke up with a jolt. I was back in my bed, drenched in sweat. My heart was racing, but I tried to calm myself, reminding myself that it was just a nightmare. But when I glanced over at my nightstand, I froze. My apartment keys, which I always kept on the counter by the front door, were sitting right next to me. I knew I hadn't brought them there. My hands were shaking as I got up to check the apartment. When I reached the living room, my blood ran cold. The front door was slightly ajar. I know I locked it before going to bed. I double check it every night. I quickly shut it and locked it again, then spent the rest of the night with all the lights on, gripping a kitchen knife. The next morning, I found another surprise, a piece of paper slipped under my door. In scrawled handwriting, it read, Nice car. You should keep it locked. My mind raced, trying to figure out if I'd seen anyone around my car recently, but nothing came to mind. I reported it to the police, but without any proof of who had left the note or how they'd gotten inside, there wasn't much they could do. They told me to be careful and to change my locks. I did. I installed extra locks and even bought a cheap security camera for the hallway. For a few days, things were quiet. But then, late one night, I heard scratching at my front door. It started as a soft, intermittent sound, like a rat gnawing at wood. But then it grew louder, more deliberate, like someone dragging their nails along the door. I pulled up the camera feed on my phone, and what I saw sent a wave of cold terror through me. The camera showed the hallway outside my door, but the image kept flickering. 
For a split second, I saw the outline of a figure standing perfectly still just out of the camera's main view. It was as if they knew exactly where the blind spot was. I called the police again, whispering into the phone, too scared to raise my voice. They arrived quickly, but when they checked the hallway, it was empty. They reassured me that they would patrol the area more often, but I could see in their faces that they thought I was just paranoid. After that night, I barely slept. I barricaded the door with a chair, but I knew it wouldn't be enough if whoever it was decided to come back. I spent my night staring at the camera feed, hoping to catch another glimpse of the figure, but the hallway remained empty. Still, the feeling of being watched never went away. Eventually, I broke my lease and moved out without saying a word to my landlord. I didn't care about the penalty. I just needed to get away from that place. A week after I moved, I drove past the old apartment one last time, just to make sure it was behind me. That's when I saw him, a man standing near the entrance wearing the same hoodie, his face still obscured. He looked right at my car as I drove past, a faint smirk pulling at the corners of his mouth. I sped away and haven't looked back since. I never found out who he was or how he knew so much about me. But I learned one thing. Sometimes when you feel like you're being watched, it's because you are. And when that feeling creeps in, you can't ignore it. Because you never know who might be on the other side of the door, waiting.